We are now live, Jody. So we're going to okay. give everybody maybe just another two minutes. I think people are still logging on. I see the participant number climbing quickly right now since we just started going live. Okay, great. They're okay. probably getting all their lunches ready. I hope they're eating yummy stuff and healthy though. Don't talk about food. <laughs> <can make> it <laughs> but um, yeah, we were just so we were just talking about Zoom fatigue and ways that you can kind of try and lighten the Zoom fatigue mood. And I was saying how Jody often has a virtual background. She likes to change it on me whenever we're talking. And her favorite go-to, other than the positive accounting logo, is this <laughs> beach that moves in the background. It honestly looks like she's on a beach. Anyways, I think it's very funny, but today we'll we'll leave the real backgrounds in for you. Well, it, uh, if the participants really want it, I'm happy to share after. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Sure. Oh, you too could be on the beach with us, virtually and in person. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. I can't believe it's March already. At least it's a bright and sunshiny day today. It is beautiful. Yeah, it's a really beautiful day. Hopefully it's a beautiful weekend. It would be nice. <sighs> I agree. No more snow. I'm done. Yes. <laughs> Hence the virtual beach background all the time. <laughs> You're, you've declared you will now be in the warmth only. Yes. <laughs> well, hopefully, hopefully soon. Yes, I don't, it depends what the groundhog readings were. So if they say spring is coming soon, then I'm, I'm all for that. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Okay, well, we are at just a minute after noon. So let's get started here. Great. So thank you very much, everybody, for joining today. Um, Jody and I are really excited to be presenting to you how to put more money in your pocket, which is a topic that we can definitely all appreciate. Uh, so I'm, uh, I'm Jennifer Watson. I'm with Watson Investments, and I'm here with Jody from Positive Accounting. We are both uh, very similar practices in the sense that we have a team approach. We're both wanting to do what's best for the client in a customizable way. Um, we are a wealth management firm and I'll let Jody kind of explain a little bit more about her company. Absolutely, thank you, Jennifer. So positive accounting by the words, it's a positive experience. Let me just say that right out the door. <laughs> you know what? I do call myself an accountant with a personality. I know, shocking, don't go tell other people. But you need to, talking about money is not sexy. And I find at our firm in particular, we, I have a team approach, same like Jennifer, and it is about the relationships that we foster. So when we're chatting to you, we wanna make sure that you understand what your needs are before we just dump a this is what you must do and how it must be and both of us are of the opinion that in putting more money in your pocket you need the proper advisors and so that's a little bit of us in a nutshell perfect well thank you uh so we're going to dive into the presentation now, but uh, before we get started, we just wanted to put our contact details up on the screen for you. If you have any questions throughout the presentation, please feel free to message them in the chat box. We might be able to answer some questions throughout the presentation or at the end. Um, we also would like to offer you free virtual consultations with either one of us. So feel free to please either send Jody an email, jody at positiveaccounting.ca or myself in the chat box, there's a link to my calendar. You can actually just book in a meeting. So whether you're a client of either one of us or both of us um, or a prospective client or someone just looking for a little bit of information or maybe a little bit more details around something we say today that and more around how it applies directly to you, please feel free to reach out. Okay. So today we're really going to be focusing on kind of two buckets. The first bucket is decision-making. So how do you go about making the right decision? What do you need to make the best decision to put more money in your pocket? The second thing is going to be then around tax strategies and more around the implementation around putting more money in your pocket. So that's how we're gonna break up the presentation today. So Jody, when we're trying to make decisions and we're putting more money in our pocket, we've kind of broken it down into three categories. Yep. Um, the why, the information, and then the data. So first about the why. <laughs> why is decision-making important and how do we go about kind of figuring out 
how to make those decisions. For sure, Jennifer. And I think, you know, in terms of the why, the biggest aspect in planning for any client is what is your outcome? What is your goal? Quite frankly, what is your why? Why are you doing this? Are you just, it's nice to hang out with us. I know Jennifer and myself, we are super cool people. However, there must be some way or idea idea that you may have and how you're going to put more money in your pocket. And so the why is not just about you. I know it sounds super um, intuitive to say that. However, it is about your goals and not for yourself, but for your family as well and what that pertains to. Because oftentimes when you're talking about accounting and tax, it encompasses the entire picture. And there's nothing worse when I say to my own clients, if you don't tell me, I will find out. And then you're not going to like it. Because you told me too late, <laughs> I can't do anything about it. So I think that that is so important because it just allows you to focus as to what is your eventual impact that you want to have, whether that be in a short or a long term. And I know, Jennifer, you feel the very same way as well when you're dealing, because I, you, you and I banter back and forth a lot about this. Mm -hmm. We do. And so for us, I, I kind of like what you said there in terms of you know, it seems like such an easy thing is to figure out the why, but sometimes it's not always easy. And it is important that you let your advisors know really what you're trying to achieve. So for us, we start with a discovery conversation and it's all about really trying to understand what your objectives are. And sometimes we're having those conversations and in particular when it's with spouses, sometimes the spouses haven't had those chats either and that's okay. It's, you know, that's our job to now bring up these topics and, and really then start those conversations because the conversations never stop. It is something that is going to change throughout life, but we need to understand what are your values. So examples is, you know, when do you want to retire? Do you want to retire? Um, maybe you want to phase out of work and work part-time and you just want that financial freedom to make the decision based on what you truly want to do and not be financially dictated. Um, maybe you want to do something for your children. So we want to understand all of these things because then they impact how we go about helping you to put more money in your pocket. I agree, Jennifer. And I must say, it has to be very customizable. The one thing that I don't like is when people are kind of um, asking their neighbor or Googling this stuff. And I find that that's not the right avenue for it because it doesn't allow you to sit with an advisor who can then plan it out for you. And you need to have both people who understand what those numbers mean. Because from an accounting perspective, if you actually do not understand that this is what's going to happen five years down the line or when your kid is going to university, then how are you going to plan for that? You don't want to have surprises, is what I like to call it. And that customizable approach is not something that you go, I don't know, to Shoppers Drug Mart and just buy the next thing off the shelf. Oh, there we go. This is for me. It's not for you. I can guarantee it and you're going to be completely unhappy. So that why is such a big thing in terms of strategy and planning. Yeah, and that, and that definitely kind of segues into the next element too, which is the information. So how do you go about getting information? It's fabulous that right now we live in an era where there's almost too much information actually at times, but we can Google something. We can say, you know, how much should I put into my RSP this year? And we can Google and we'll find articles about what to do. And I think that, I mean, if you want to educate yourself, that's awesome. I think that that's really important. Um, but then we need to understand more around that. So it's every single person's circumstances are so different. So I think, I mean, the neighbor example is, you know, my neighbor says, and I always find it very interesting when people say this to me, in particular around, normally it's around investment returns. So like my neighbor got X return this year and why did, oh, I, boy. Or why did I get less? And, and it's always very interesting, but I think what's important is that's fine to have those conversations and ask those questions and learn everything. But then we have to make sure that it goes always back to the why. So in terms of why did I get a higher return? well, maybe your risk tolerance was different and maybe your objectives were different and maybe you have all these other factors that come into the plan, which lead to this outcome being the right outcome for you in achieving your goals. So that's definitely a really important element as well. 
you know what the thing is, Jennifer, because there's too much information overload is what I call it. We have become so accustomed to being a society. We want instantaneous gratification. So yeah. instantly, I want the answer now and it's going to be quickly done and then everything will just work fine. But in reality, it doesn't. And the information, I'm going to say, is one of the key crux pieces because as much as it's nice to chat to your neighbors and Google and anyone you can find who's going to speak to you without a mask, then I'm going to say, take it with a pinch of salt because somebody else's opinion is not your reality. And I say that as much in jest as in truth, because oftentimes these things are not relevant to your situation. You don't know what's going on in the back end. And that information can be so skewed that you will jump onto it and make a wrong decision. And then I call them very expensive school fees, unfortunately, because you're paying for that education. Yes, definitely. And I guess, you know, the saying, we don't know, we don't know is so true. So educating and asking the right questions to the right people and give it, and then also being very free and open to give them the right information that they need um, will just help that experience. It will help you achieve a better outcome because there are so many factors that go in. So when I use the example of you Google the RSP, you know, how much should I contribute? Yeah. Likely you'll probably get just what's the RSP cap that year, but is that the right limit for you? Well, I don't know, but if I had asked you a few other questions, then we would know and we would be able to have a better plan that's going to help you again, achieve exactly what you wanna be achieving um, and put more money in your pocket with that objective. <laughs> I think too, Jennifer, you know, th the biggest issue is how are you finding this information? Because if you have access to it and so do 200 others, how does that differentiate you? Like honest to goodness, because saying that my friend works at a, a bank and he has a little bit of financial knowledge is not speaking to an actual investment advisor. It's not speaking to an actual accountant. And it's sad to say, because I'm not a big bias towards this, but check for the credentials. In fact, all the, pan if all the callers here today, I would love them to go Google the CRA site. Please go, go and knock yourself out. If you can define it and understand it, come back to me. Because the jargon and the lingo in there is sure to trick you up. Mm -hmm. And if anyone out there can say to me that, yes, it's so straightforward, like all the subsidies and stuff that we received in the last year due to COVID, then you know what? All the power to you. <laughs> there has been a lot of moving parts this past year with COVID, um, both on the personal side and the business side. There's a lot of things, and I know yes. we'll do a few of those things later on in the presentation. But it is definitely a year that professional advice will be well worth it um, because of all the moving parts. I think if we were to be able to quantify how many people actually file returns themselves versus get professional help this year, I would hope we would see more in the professional help realm. I do worry yes. that people have more time on their hands at home. So therefore, they might be more inclined to do their own tax returns, as an example. But I just worry because, you know, this year there's been lots of grants, a lot of, unfortunately, moving jobs, um, layoffs, yes. and that does impact the returns and the planning process. So I think it's, it's always worth the money to spend to get uh, an accountant really to go and look and file your return because relative to the potential refunds, I mean, it's definitely, definitely worth it. So. And I'm going to say in particular in this year, just because of the moving parts and the complexities around it. Like, I mean, if people are going to be applying for things like working from home, there are so many different things you need to know so that you don't go and unnecessarily shoot yourself in the foot because the CRA does not look kindly upon ignorance. They will hold you accountable and then you will get dinged for wrongfully filing things. And this particular year with SERP payments, the subsidies, the loans, the grants, I'm telling you, it's turning me gray, man. Jennifer, it's turning me gray. And I'm just taking one for the team. <laughs> I don't know if I could point out my roots or if that's it. <laughs> really, I just need hair salons to open up again. Um, and so, okay, so then moving to kind of the data then. So we've talked now about the why, the information of the data. So having for us, like the biggest thing I think to help anybody is having the speed of the data and having it accurate to make those decisions when you want. 
Um, so I'll give you kind of examples of actually what I mean about this though, in terms of like from our, our own business management as an example, you know, we moved to positive accounting last year, which was the decision we were making because it is all digital. Um, it would allow us to have daily accurate numbers at our fingertips, which I really wanted. And, you know, that was a great decision. And so then all of a sudden COVID hit and there's all these subsidies coming up and we weren't fully onboarded into the new process yet. So we were partially online, but we were still on getting that onboarding. So we had just made that decision to move to Jody's team. So through that, you know, I, I do have the skills to run Excel models. So I was running Excel models to see, you know, what do we qualify for in government grants? Like what should we be doing right now? As well as really just focusing on the clients and what's best for them too. But if having the accurate information at your fingertips then allows us to, when there's all of a sudden that quick decision, we know the answer and we can act on that immediately, which is really important. And so from the personal perspective, you know, for us, like I see this as being our cash flow projections for clients is if clients have cash flow projection forecasts and therefore it gives them a better understanding of how spending today impacts the future, then when something comes up and happens, we can either already know that we're going to be okay, and, or we know that we can make that financial choice, or we know we can quickly relook at the numbers. We've already inputted your information into the system, so we can just update everything, which is a little bit faster then, and then show you the cash flow, the updated cash flow to help you either maybe stay calm in a job uh, change scenario. Or maybe it's that second property has come up and you're like, this is my dream. Can I go and buy this right now? And what does this, like, how does this now impact my retirement plan or my values of how I wanted to give money to my children one day? So it's, it's that then speed and understanding that is just so powerful and important to have. You know, Jennifer, the thing is information is, is a very important tool and the data needs to be available at your fingertips, like you said. So thank you for that. I mean, we very much specialize at positive accounting in cloud and paperless bookkeeping. And I can tell you the shift we have seen is that companies or even individuals that were thinking of going online or planning to get onto the cloud in maybe five or 10 years, you had no choice. It, you had to do it almost immediately. As soon as things were shut down last year because of circumstances and environment and all the rest of it, you were almost forced into getting online and moving things. And it's not necessarily a bad thing. You know, sometimes we think that, oh my word, I'm in the cloud, people are gonna see all my stuff. If you Google at any one point in time, you're already there. You are already doing either online banking or you're on Facebook or you're on some sort of social media where they have picked up your profiles already. So why not use those things to your advantage, but use it in a financial sense? So in that capacity, the data that you're going to be receiving from your actual numbers should be current, not the ones that you saw last year, or not the ones that maybe are read in the newspaper and, and you know, it's out dated because in making decisions especially when it comes to money you need to make sure you're on the ball yeah and that it's ready to go when you're ready to go yeah and that actually makes me really think of something um that for our, our clients we often we do really highly suggest consolidating your investment accounts so what we find is a lot of the time people have accounts all over the place they've worked here they have an account there they started a bank account at this bank they have a bank account there and it's kind of scattered so we really encourage that consolidation um, for so many reasons, but one of them is the data. So for example, when we're looking at tax planning considerations, so RSP limits, TFSA limits, um, tax loss carried forward limits, the CRA site is a great tool. So we get access to view our client CRA data for them. It's just, instead of them having to go get the information, it's just, we can go do it for them. and. So we do that, but there is a lag on the site. So the site, really right? shocking. I know. <laughs> so there's a little bit of a lag on the site. And so what that means is then we have to say, okay, this is probably when the information was updated. Therefore, okay, what other things have we done with the accounts we're managing to figure out what's the true total so we don't over contribute or we don't 
sell something thinking we can offset it with a tax loss that isn't there anymore. But if you don't have those accounts consolidated, then the advisor is basically blind to things that are elsewhere. So we yes. don't really know. And then we're now relying on the client to be the quarterback versus us being the quarterback and relaying with the accountant and maybe the lawyer and other providers. So it is, it's definitely, you know, so important to help with those decisions. And then it, it ultimately will lead to more money for clients. I like your approach, Jennifer, because you know what, that's why I like to, to send our clients to you, because <laughs> I do find that your investment knowledge um, is, is all encompassing, because it's important to see what is on file. There's nothing worse than trying to plan and you're actually not looking at the CRA site. Oftentimes, you know, in the old days, when you used to do tax returns, you had to do them manually, and then you had to vet all the slips and you have to do all these things. Now there's tools, when we prepare returns, you actually download that information straight from the horse's mouth, so to speak. So anything that has been filed with the CRA, we are able to access it, download it, and you have it. So it's a it's a more of a matching exercise, number one. But also if things are missing or they submitted late, you can actually call up your advisors or your bank or whoever else and say, listen, I actually don't have this stuff. The pieces of the puzzle are missing in order to do my tax returns. And who knows, this year... We're not sure again if the deadline may move or not. I hope not. Last year was just a never ending tax season until September. Sorry to say that. But at least to be proactive about making sure you know what the government has on file for you. Because like yourself, Jennifer, when you're planning, I'm sure you don't want, you want to know what people's limits are for the RRSP, the TFSAs, because even from an accounting standpoint, if I'm not giving you those numbers and then the client wants to invest money they don't have, there's a very strict law against over contributions. And for people on the call, you actually get taxed on over contributions, just so you know. It's not like a nice to have and the CRA keeps it there for you. It's a very serious and onerous task and you get dinged and there's interest and penalties on over contributions for RRSPs. Public service announcement, I know. I don't want to be all doom and gloom, but yes. Yeah. And <laughs> I mean, as for the, you know, the deadline for, to file taxes was extended last year. And I, I, as much as it was very difficult, probably for accountants who normally have their busy season and maybe get to take a, a moment breath after, but <laughs> it's, I also think that, you know, if you were somebody that was expecting a tax refund, you got to file well, it. Get it in. Possible because money in your pocket as soon as possible means you can do something more with it. And I actually wrote an article um, last week about this in terms of what to do with tax refunds. And it's going to be published in uh, the Neighbors magazine. And then also a longer version will go on my LinkedIn profile. But it's about, you know, when you get that refund and hopefully you do. And if you're not, is there a way to get that refund for the future? Um, you know, where can you go and put that money? So filing taxes. And actually the other point is if you owe money, if you're going to owe money too, mm. you got to file at least by the deadline, because otherwise you're getting penalized on that outstanding balance for the time. And, you, and, and the interest, do do don't forget, because the interest accumulates rapidly on a daily basis. It is very high interest. Yes. Yeah. So you don't want to do that, especially when interest rates are so low right now, but for things like this, they are not as low. Um, so yeah, very important. Okay, well, I think we should move on to kind of the second part of the presentation. Yes. Which is really, we've kind of already started talking about tax tips and strategies, but we're going to dive even more into that. So when we're looking at these other considerations, um, you know, first is identifying the objectives. We have touched on this a little bit, but to give some more examples is objectives is so that when we're competing for priorities as an example, so we're saying, okay, we have, let's say a mortgage, we have our children's education to plan for, we have retirement to plan for. Well, those are very important. So we wanna know what's the most important, but we also wanna know that dollar that you can save every month, where are you gonna get the biggest bang for your buck putting it somewhere? Yes. So, how can we maximize the government grants? How can we maximize the returns from the tax planning perspective? And then we go beyond that and we say, okay, and now how can we invest the money? And which type of investment should be in which kind of vehicle? So is it the RSP, TFSA, spousal? Um, is it holding companies? Like how does that all work? And how do they all relate to actually get to your ultimate goals and objectives in the short and the long term? 
And to add to that, Jennifer, I say some of the strategies would also be broken up further in terms of what do you want as a, for your life and what do you want for your business, for any business owners on the call, because they're two different things. Mm -hmm. And sometimes in dealing with them too separately also, you, you have to make sure that you are heading in the right direction and achieving those goals. Because if your objective personally is then to I don't know, have retirement money and do things, you need to make sure that your business is factored into this. Because mm -hmm. if you don't, then suddenly you're going to wake up and be like, oh, I, I think I missed out on this opportunity. And now this, because there's so many tax planning as well, which is the next section we're going to delve into mm -hmm. in terms of making sure between the two that we can liaise and do that. And that objective is fairly critical. I'll give you an example. You know, oftentimes when I meet with business owners, they don't even realize, quite frankly, that as a legal entity, the business and themselves are separate. And it's true, you may be signing the checks or you may be having all the bank accounts and you may be listed as the owner, but guess what? You are effectively an employee of your own company. That's how it needs to be seen. Mm -hmm. But the business can provide you with the shelter, the protection, and also the tax planning that you need from a personal capacity. And it's, it's very interesting to see that kind of mindset change, mm -hmm. because if you don't look at them as interrelated parties, then you're actually losing out on that opportunity. Yeah, makes sense. And for, uh, I mentioned before, you know, kind of that dollar that you can save. Well, when you're retired, there's still objectives that you have. You're still trying to, how can I fund my lifestyle while reducing taxes um, is there an opportunity to gift money and maybe it's gifting to grandkids, maybe it's charities. Well, what's the best way to go about doing that to achieve the objectives while minimizing the tax to keep more money in your pocket to then have more freedom with your own money, which is, I think it should be the ultimate goal is for you to make those decisions, not the government to make those decisions for you. Um, and so yes. the objectives never there's never one point in time where your objectives end. It's it's throughout your life. You got to keep reassessing what's important and your values will definitely change over time. They, they might. Um, so just keeping those ongoing, honest conversations going and knowing, I think having, making sure you have those advisors too that are not going to judge you or, you know, Jody as my bookkeeper again, like she, she knows so much about me. And I'll divulge all the gory details later. <laughs> Yeah, you know when I go out for Starbucks with someone and everything, but it, it's really helpful. And I know that she's she's looking at this to then try and help me get the most for the company and and then for my personal returns and things too. So yeah, it's definitely important to have to feel like you have that open, open conversation and dialogue with people that you are working closely with. So I agree, Jennifer, because your advisors are there to support you. Honest to goodness, to support you and to help you and also to make sure that it aligns with your values. Because if you are thinking then of selling a business or of doing something else with your partner, it's important to keep your, your partners and your spouses involved as well. I mean, it sounds like an obvious thing to do, but you'd be very surprised how people do not actually communicate to each other. I know, a bit of a surprise there. But if you don't know what, as, as a family, so it's so many different parts. So I'm gonna talk about, as, a, as an example, you're first gonna have your family global vision. What do you want for your family? Then you're gonna have, once your extended family or your kids move out, whatever, then your second vision should be, what is the plan for yourself and your spouse? And then you micro that and come down to what is a plan for yourself? And I will say all of these involve numbers. And I, I don't know if I said this earlier, but you know, talking about money is not sexy. It isn't. And people kind of dissuade from those discussions because they're either afraid, they don't understand, or it sounds like super complicated. And I know, Jennifer, you and I are both of the opinion where we don't speak the lingo. I mean, we both can if you want us to, but there's no need for it. They rather have someone who deciphers that stuff for you and makes it more available for you to talk to directly. Yeah, that's important, definitely, to make sure that you know, we, we all speak the same language when we're talking about money because it's already complicated enough. We don't need to add in all the acronyms. Um, my sister likes to tell me because she's a lawyer and she says, 
because I'll, I'll use the acronym sometimes with her. She's like, you know, I could do this too, you know, Jen. And then she starts throwing them all out and, and neither one of us then knows <laughs> what the other one's saying. So it just doesn't work. Um, so yeah, speak the same language, make sure we all can understand. That is actually one of the major criticisms of uh, financial planners actually is. Of both our industries, people, quite frankly. Yeah, okay. So people say that they're like, I just don't understand what they're saying. So you need to make sure that that's not the case. And if you, if it is, you feel, no one judges, just feel free to yes. say, I don't understand that. Um, and then we can try it a different way and explain it a different way because it also helps us then. We, we learn that this maybe isn't the best way to explain something in the future. So it, it's really helpful if you can be own, honest and open and yeah. what are the strategies to use for this too, Jennifer? Is, you know, people think they have to have this big plan and it's all document. Write the thing down. Like just start. Be, like that would be my tip for today is start writing it down. What do you want to see? And 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 kind of work like the, like I mentioned the global and then bring it down and then down and then micro it to yourself because mm -hmm. you know just that little written piece of documentation. They say it's such a great form of brain and mind linkage because in typing it all up it's not the same thing i know it's going to sound like so old school but it's true and then you kind of put all your thoughts down and then you kind of filter it because then you'll have some sort of direction and then you can speak to an advisor who can help you to properly align what you're thinking and put that into a proper format and document yeah yeah, I think that's definitely really important, you know, regardless of who you're working with, make sure you have some summary of yourself at one point in time that outlines, you know, all your assets, all your objectives, and then have a process that is written out with basically the checklist. And I know Jody will talk about checklists and she loves her checklist and so do we. <laughs> and so for us, we have something that's called the financial planning priorities and it's a few different categories that we write out you know, what's specific for the client, what's the strategy at this point in time, what's the date, who's doing what, how are we coordinating it all? And it basically allows us all to stay organized and make sure that we're actually working through these items. So the items are debt management, cash flow management, retirement planning, estate planning, um, tax planning, retirement planning, uh, kids education. So lots of important things and then looking at cash flow projections. And so I guess bringing us to tax planning tips for individuals. Um, do you want to, do you want to start on that, Jody? Do you want to start? Ooh, all the start? stuff. Oh, oh, absolutely. I'll, I'll jump in. So yeah. I'm going to take off where you left off in terms of checklists. So already yeah. I'm, I'm a big proponent of checklists. I just think it keeps us all focused. It keeps us directed and we all have the common expectation and goal. So already on my website, total plug for myself. Sorry, Jennifer. I have got my tax checklist up and ready for 2020. And it's got all those lovely presents about the, the grants, the subs, the work from home. Da, 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 da. And I like the checklist because it allows you to, to then plan. But most importantly, make sure, this is my number one tech step, is file your returns together. I cannot tell you, Jennifer, how often I see partners, whether they're common law or spouses, they just independently file. And it, what's going to happen is in doing so, you actually get independently assessed. But believe it or not, the CRA knows you live together because you'll have the so, same home address or you'll have each other on each other's returns and then both of you will get reassessed. So in a situation like that, it actually does not maximize your return. You don't get the best refunds and the things that we can give you credits because you can get credits for your spouse if they're not employed or they earn less than you. There's all kinds of, of juicy bits that, that you can do, but you need to make sure that you file together. Now, having said that, that brings me back to that point where, you know, you can Google stuff or you can go to shoppers and buy a pa tax package thing and come home and pretend you're going to file that thing. In my professional opinion, I have seen many, many times that that software does not actually guide you correctly. It doesn't ask you all the things you need to know, and it doesn't even allow you to move things between spouses or partners or even children, for that matter, to take advantage of those credits. And it's a sad reality, but the accountants, we do have the insight on this. We really do, because the software that we use is so robust. It allows you then to make those adjustments 
investments and only accountants can do that. So the normal layperson is not going to know about this. And I find that it's a bit of a, of a tricky situation, Jennifer, because it's if you think about it, it's being plugged as something that's being able to help you, but it's helping you maybe 80%. The other 10%, it doesn't tell you, which is very unfortunate because remember, those tools are also being provided by the CRA, which is the government. So the more money they don't have to give you back, the better for them. Hmm. Interesting. And so you mentioned uh, children filing their returns. So yes. you know, when should we be filing returns? So this is maybe something we can all tell our, our friends who have kids, or our children, our grandchildren. So when should they be filing their return? You know what, if your child is working at the legal age to work is 14, as soon as they're working, you need to file a return, even if it's under the threshold. And I'll tell you why. As soon as you file, effectively, you get them into the system. Once they're in the system, then they can start building up the RRSP room. They can start building up their credit rating. They can start building up and getting their free HST credits back. Mm -hmm. So all of this makes sense that they're in the system sooner so that as they grow out into the workforce, they already have some sort of legacy or, or numbers to work from. When you don't file a return for your child that has been working, it's actually to their detriment because there's lots of free money out there. I'm going to say just like it is. So when you file that return, they actually get, are eligible to apply for that. Because think of last year, when there were so many government grants and things that were being offered to students, to, to kids who were working, um, summer, summer students. But if you never filed a return, you were not eligible to get that free money. So it really goes to show that it pays in order to make sure you're on the system. And more often than not, like I would say 90% of the students that we file don't ever have to pay any taxes because they're under the threshold. So you need to make sure that you cover that. So okay. I know you're reading the chat session, but I'm I am reading. One more I'm thing. reading that. <laughs> There's a question that just came in. So yes. I can just read this out loud and ask you to you, Jody. Um, so if you and your partner bought a house and moved in together in September, 2020, do you have to wait until 2021 to start filing together, not married yet? So actually, I mean, you have to, for tax law, it's 12 months of living together. So. Correct. But I will say, Jennifer, when you file your return, they will ask you from what date have you started cohabitating? Because as soon as you start cohabitating, you initially become common law. So although it's September of 22, you'll have to put that onto your tax return. If you check out, download my free tax checklist, that's one of the first questions I ask on that thing, because we have to prorate that a portion. I know, so I don't want to use that heavy accounting lingo. We'll just adjust it and make sure that we have to put that portion in there and CRA knows that you are living in common law together. And file together. Even though you're not married, you should file your returns together because there's things like the climate action incentive and working from home rebates and all kind of things that you can already start taking advantage of. Okay. And, and now if you, if you don't file together, so if you don't declare it um, and you and it basically, if you don't declare and it somehow benefited one of you for not declaring it, you could get penalized for that too. So you do have to be honest. Like Jody said earlier, they know you live together because you have the same address. So unless you're filing rent receipts, which you wouldn't be, you're filing it together. Um, <laughs> yeah. Common law for family law. And I'm not a lawyer. I've already said my sister is a family lawyer, um, but you know, so get professional advice in this area. I don't want to give it, but tax for tax considerations and for family law, there is a bit of a difference, but I think it would definitely be important to get professional help. Um, if you have assets, you want to be protecting going into this, um, make sure you you've aligned with the accountant and then also the legal perspective. Um, if that applies for you before you do anything as well, but April's coming up quickly. So it gives us a little bit of a deadline to have to take care of all these things. Yes, I agree. And you're right, because there's a lot of uh, legalities involved as well. And in speaking 
to your your partner as well to make sure that they're on board with understanding what this means because people think oh no they're going to get me because now we're filing together it's not that you actually benefit from filing together i have many many conversations about this uh, from a tax perspective so i'm happy to to chat more about it as well jennifer and i mean even from a financial planning perspective jennifer like what how would you suggest that you know as an example that you can offer us for saving for tax planning yeah, well, so it does somewhat depend on again what you're what you're trying to achieve. So if you've just started living together, maybe you're not ready to combine finances yet. And that's definitely understandable. So when you are ready and you have a common law spouse or someone you're married to, um, there is a lot more options basically for the tax planning perspective. They do open up. So the kind of the low hanging fruit ones are RSP. Uh, we typically try and keep account sizes relatively equal for pension money between spouses. Um, it allows us to have more, more flexibility when it comes closer to retirement and then in retirement um, to pull out money to try and lower the tax um, brackets. Right now there, in, there is pension income splitting when you retire but that wasn't always the case and we don't know what's gonna happen in the future. So trying to keep those accounts relatively equal. Um, the other thing is having beneficiaries on your RSP and your TFSA when it's your common law partner or your spouse is important. Again, if that matches with your value of what you're trying to achieve. Um, so again, you can get this very complicated. Maybe you're not combining finances. Maybe you have blended families, things like that. Um, but if you are trying to combine finances, if you have the RSP beneficiary for your spouse or the TFSA, if basically if something happens to you and you pass away, um, the money rolls over into the other person's name without any tax impact at that point in time, which is really, really powerful because it keeps that investment in the tax sheltered vehicle. So it allows us to continue to grow up grow more with the tfsa you actually get it if you if it goes to a common law partner or spouse you get that amount added to your tfsa room basically as long as you keep it in the tfsa so yes. if you pull it out you don't get the added room but if you keep it within the tfsa bucket so it's a huge huge tax planning lots of savings around that um if again that makes sense for you and your partner um yeah, I agree. Lots and of things come into play there. And there's a lot of always considerations like with inheritance, where do you put the money? Yes. Really important just to make sure it aligns with those values. And to add to that too, Jennifer, it, you know, it brings me back to the idea of we need to think of a will. You know, it's not something that you want to talk about, but unfortunately, the only two things in common are going to be death and taxes. So when you're thinking about yourself, it's important to have that will in play because it helps for your estate planning. It helps me filing those returns. The last thing you want to do is, and I've seen this over the years, when you don't have that will in play, then when we have to file those estate returns, there's a large chunk, unfortunately, that just has to go straight to the government mm -hmm. because you haven't actually aligned as to where you need to put that. And I'm going to say that as a family, they need to talk about this openly because people are like well you know we know it's going to happen but not now do it now have something in play what no matter how minimal it is even for common law partners if you have something in play then at least you have that hold over that money and you can make decisions because all too often i mean it's sad to say life happens and if that does happen to you from a tax perspective, I would like to keep more money in your pocket for yeah. those estate planning situations that we don't have to run into unnecessary problems. Mm -hmm. And I know, Jennifer, you've helped a few of our clients as well with that, because then we can take that money, reinvest it, make sure that the cash flow is there. Because the last thing you need from an estate perspective is there's no money then to pay everything else that's going on. Yeah. Yeah. You don't want money to be locked in. You just want to make your life. It's already a chaotic time when a loved one passes. So make it as simple as possible for you. And there's lots of things that we want to do to make sure that that's the case. Um, another question came in. So I'm just going to read that out loud so we can, we can answer that as well before we continue on. Uh, thank you guys very much for the questions, by the way, they definitely add a lot to the conversation. So I appreciate it. <laughs> Uh, so if you are financially independent in the top tax bracket, 
and income splitting with your spouse, is it beneficial to start a business in retirement? Um, I feel like that question, there's, I think we need a little bit more detail around what's happening. So start a business in retirement. Do you already have a business right now and you're starting a new business? Are you, do you have an existing business? And then you're looking at how can I income split in retirement? Um, if you already have a business, so again, we, we want to loop in the accountant for this conversation. Um, but if you already have a business and then you retire, you're actually, once you hit a certain age, you are able to, um, in an operating business now, add in the spouse um, to do dividend splitting. So there is a certain threshold when you reach a certain age and then you want to start doing that to help with the income splitting. Um, because of a few years ago, when you own, when you have a company, all the rules changed on us. Oh. So now we had to get a little bit more creative with how can we pull out money and keep it relatively equal. Uh, I think if you, anytime you have a company, again, it's every time you have something else that adds almost a extra layer, it gives us more options. So with a company, it's, you know, from the investment perspective, you can invest within the company. So a company allows you maybe not to have to pull out all the money and claim it as personal income and then invest some of it. And personally, you could leave the money in the company and invest within the company. Therefore, it's keeping it at this either the small business tax rate or the corporate tax rate, which would be less. Um, again, lots of other rules kind of get considered. Uh, real estate agents, for example, you know, you can now incorporate this year, which is fabulous. Yay. If it makes sense for you, it's fabulous. Because if it yes. doesn't make sense, then you're just adding a lot of complication and fees. Um, but if it makes sense, it is great. Um, that company, that type of a company, you wouldn't have a holding company for the investment purpose. You'd have, it has to be within that company. Whereas if you have different type of operating companies, you might have separate companies for the purpose of income splitting with spouses um, or for investing um, separation of kind of the assets and the liabilities. And it's sometimes a really good plan, but you, you definitely need the accountant to lay out that plan and <laughs> financial planner can help as well with that. So I'm not sure if that answered, if that answered the question, Jody, do you want to add to the, the kind of the answer? I would say, you know, if you don't have a current business, say you're self-employed and say you're employed right now, you're earning a T4 mm -hmm. and you're basically getting credits for your spouse who, who you're doing income splitting with. You have to see what your goal is, because if once you retire, it would be pointless from scratch just starting up a business for the sake of starting a business up, mm -hmm. because it sounds like, oh, the thing to do. If your objective and your goal, depending if you're a high income tax bracket earner, there may be pensions, there may be other the things that we don't know that could attribute to this, but you can't start a business. And I want to be clear about this. People think you can just go open up a business and then any kind of pensions or incomes or money you're earning, dump it in the business. You cannot do that. So there's, there's just no way that the government will allow that because it's personally attributable to you. If you're going to open up a business that way suddenly, since you've retired, you're now consulting or say you decided to open up a handyman business or something like that, then you know what? Fantastic. You can certainly do that. But there's two types of businesses. One is a sole proprietorship and one is an incorporation. And the tax advantages between the two are also very different. So the idea of, of a business is lucrative if it aligns again, I'm going to say, with your objectives and your plan. Because the last thing you want to do is have a business and suddenly it's actually taking out more money than what you're putting in. So business sounds also airy fairy and, and a great start, but the plan would be how do you want to keep more money in your pocket and what does it look like at retirement for you? What's happening? That plan, then we can decipher and determine as to where the best situation would be for you. Well, I think that's a great start. And I don't know if uh, the, I don't, I don't want to say the person's name. I don't think you can see it in the chat box, but uh, so if, if you ask that question and you want to give us a little bit more detail to maybe make our answer a little bit more specific, feel free to do so. And I'll, I'll make sure I read it. Um, and then we'll, we'll, we'll get Jody's and my opinion on that. Um, otherwise, I hope that that did give you a little bit more insight into what you were trying to achieve. Definitely in the top tax bracket. I mean, yeah, you're paying over 53% in tax is marginally. Um, yeah. You definitely need to be doing tax planning. Sounds like your income splitting already with your spouse. So that's a good start. Um, there's probably maybe more that you can be doing and 
And I do think that at every at every age and stage of life, you honestly do need to be thinking about that future and that and the retirement and how can we how can we go about um, reducing taxes while still getting income and also then the government grants and retirement. How can we go and actually get those? You know, there's for some OAS, for example, it gets clawed back at a certain gets, I was just going to say that. <laughs> yeah. So, but maybe there is an opportunity to get out money in different ways, like using the tax-free savings account for a few years to get the income you need to live off of while not interrupting the, for the grant purposes. Um, anytime you're basically between the ages of 60 and 70, regardless as if you're retired or not, there's a lot of tax planning in there that should be done um, to basically better prepare you for the future and take advantage of a lot of the different tax rules. Um, yes, and without having to give your hard earned money back. Because I, I again, an example would be when you're in a higher income tax bracket and then suddenly you are cashing in your T4 roofs or your RRSPs, there's certain ways we can mitigate that so that you're not having to come out on the down end. Because if your income is too high in later years, then you have all the clawbacks. And that's totally unfortunate because you've already contributed your CPP, your EI, your, all your pension. And so you want your, your money from the government. Let's be honest. I want my money. I gave my money. I'm a hardworking citizen. So in order to do that, you need to make sure that you 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 have that covered. And uh, okay, so another another question came in, but then also a comment about the last question. So let's go. I'm going to go to the comment about the last question first to conclude that out, and then we'll go to the other question. Um, sure. So so the person appreciated the response. Uh, the career was in employee, not a business, so would be splitting on the retirement income. Was just wondering if there was any benefit of a business in retirement to save tax. Um, I would say I would no. Range. Yeah, so no, yeah, there, there isn't then with that additional information. But I'm happy to have a chat with you further about this, just to see what your tax status looks like. And then between Jennifer and I, I know we'll take good care of you. Yeah, I think that's a great way of yeah, concluding that question i'm happy to definitely dive a little bit deeper with you offline about this yeah. and one of the other questions i think here jennifer is about real estate which is you know it's such a common area right now because real estate agents are allowed to incorporate and so i just want to give a very brief understanding of why people incorporate there's only two reasons go check this out on my website i do look like my picture there <laughs> the first reason is a tax benefit as a personal as a person who invests in real estate and you have properties and all the rest of it you will pay tax at the higher bracket so you're looking at 40 percent in the personal capacity when you incorporate immediately your tax savings come down to 10 to 15 percent that's why people incorporate number one the second important reason is called limited liability. And because I'm not a lawyer, I'm just going to tell you from an accounting perspective, it means if you ever get sued from a limited liability perspective, when you are having everything in your personal tax returns as a sole proprietor, they will take you for everything. All your personal assets, your spousal assets, your home, everything is bundled into one. When you are independent, and you have the corporation, they can only come after what's in the business because it's a separate legal entity. That's why people incorporate. Now, why real estate agents specifically have been allowed to incorporate is the fact that if you are a higher income earner, imagine the tax savings. You were paying 40% and now you're at 10. I mean, that's like chalk and cheese. And the only reason that people create separate investment companies and incorporation is if you're gonna be delving into more than one property. Because if you think of Matami Homes, for example, if they are building on, let's use some nice bird names, Chickadee Crescent and then Pheasant, and then a, they would have separate companies for each of those. Because if anything ever goes wrong and somebody sues you, you can only go after what's in that company. You can't go after the entire Matami home structure. So when you're doing investments for yourself, if you have one property at this stage, I'm going to say it's ideal to keep it in your personal name 
depending on your situation though, again, I don't want to just say, hey, that's for you, man. But depending on your situation, that would be a, a better way to work on it. But if you start investing into more properties and you're looking into more rentals or student house or whatever else your plan is, then you would be well advised to go into incorporating. And again, Jennifer, I think it comes back to what is the plan? Is it what is the short term plan? What is the long term plan? And how can we help you? Because even real estate is part of investing. Am I right, Jennifer? Yes, it definitely is. I mean, it does get incorporated into our plans for clients. It has to be considered. And if you are planning on owning, um, for example, investment real estate properties, especially while you're working in a higher tax bracket, you really need the accountant because you need to try and make sure that you're not adding that rental income if you don't need to, to your taxable income every year. You, you want to be offsetting it with expenses if, if they exist, of course. Um, we want to try and do things like that, like home improvements, which will add value. Um, but yeah, I mean, Jody really answered that well, is the separation is, is often it's for the liability. Um, and then if it's going to be generating a lot of income at a certain point, you might want it to be in a company because then now the income's in the company, it's at the lower bracket. Maybe we never even pull it out to the personal. We even invest within that. Uh, your personal residence, uh, it's typically owned personally. It's tax-free in Canada. Um, your personal residence, though, you actually can decide which, if you have multiple properties that you use for yourself, not for rental income, um, but for yourself. So you have a cottage and a house, let's say, you can actually pick from year to year, which one is your personal residence based on the growth that you want to tax shelter. Because with our personal residence, when we sell it, there's no taxable implication there. Um, it's unlike an investment. If we sold an investment property, there would be a taxable implication. So, right. so for the personal residence, you want to consider that um, as well. And I think to make those choices, sometimes you have to be aware of what that's going to mean, because where will the capital gain be the highest? Because either way, you can't have two properties in your name, because one, when you sell, must have a capital gains. But there's also things like a personal capital gain exemption that you are entitled to over your lifetime. Like There's all these prettiness is like what I call it. Um, and, and when you're at that stage, then it would be best to actually make sure that we work out what that plan looks like. So you don't, you fall under the threshold without having to pay too much. That's great. Well, thank you for that. Um, okay. I want to, I want to dive. We only have a few more minutes, so we won't take up too much more time um, just to end on time at one o'clock today, but just to go back to the personal side of things for the tax planning um, I'll just quickly mention, you know, there are a lot of things that you can be doing. Uh, one that we haven't mentioned yet is the concept of paying yourself first. So automatic contributions, maybe you link it with your paycheck. So you get paid bi-weekly. Automatic contributions go into your the right investment account for the best tax benefit, gets invested right away. And that's helping putting the money out of sight, out of mind. Um, it's, you know, money lots to do with psychology and how we think about it but it is honestly it's if it's in a different bank account it's not there and you're saving for your future which is really important so you want to be doing things like that again just making sure which account which vehicle you're investing into tax-free savings account as an example it's a vehicle you can put an investment in it uh, which is important it shouldn't be used as just a savings account um, very rare that I would ever suggest that. So really make sure that you're utilizing all these different vehicles because, you know, they add so much value. Um, plus then the investment piece on top of that adds a lot of value. Uh, Jody, is there anything else from the personal tax planning side that we haven't covered yet that we want to add? No, I think that we are good for right now. The one thing I did want to mention is just make sure that you're on time. <laughs> I know it sounds like such an obvious thing, but it actually is to your benefit when you file your taxes on time. I mean, mm -hmm. it's sad to say, but last week, for example, I actually had a client contact us who hasn't filed for the last 10 years. And they haven't filed purely because they know they're going to get refunds. And I'm thinking, don't delay. You know what? There's so much in the flux at the moment. 
government is dishing out money right, left, and center. Make sure that when you file, file on time. You don't have interest. You don't have penalties, and get those refunds. And then, Jennifer, it's all yours after that. My job is just to make sure that I can get them as much money back as possible. And so, I guess to kind of conclude, then on that note, is you know, tax planning is when it, when the when the file comes to Jody when she's working with her clients, and I know because I am one of her clients, is, you know, we're dealing with it throughout the entire year. We are working towards the plan. Same with us, is we are working on the tax plan the entire year. Then come tax planning, a lot of the planning is done, but not all of it yet. So when we actually go to file that return now, uh, a lot of the time it's now taking what we've done and implementing it and implementing it correctly, and making sure then that we get, you know, the most money back is ultimately the goal um, always. And maybe it's from a family perspective. So maybe one spouse isn't getting as big or any return the other spouse is. So try and think of it as a family perspective. Um, but yeah, that's, you know, it's, it's very important to make sure that you're doing that. Um, and one example would be if you're filing and you have, let's say we've put money into an RSP, but we don't want to claim the RSP contribution this year. So that is sometimes a strategy that we use. Um, again, there's other factors that we go into play, knowing what's happening this year compared to what we think is going to happen with you in the future. Um, but then the filing stage, that's an example where Jody knows, okay, I'm not claiming that. But if we go to someone else that doesn't know the full picture, they might just claim it because that's the default. Um, so we yeah. don't want to be defaulting. We don't want to be missing <laughs> opportunities. Um, well, thank you. You know very what, Jennifer, you're right. I just want to say one last thing. You know, sure. you can plan all you want, but at the end of the day, you have got to execute on that. Mm -hmm. Don't just leave it as, this was a great conversation. These two gals know what they're talking about. Execute it so that you can go forward. Yeah, definitely. And so thank you very much, everybody, for joining today. We really, really appreciate your time. Thank you. Um, Jody and I would love to have a conversation with you after this. I know there's been a few questions, so hopefully we'll we'll get to follow up with all of you, um, plus everybody else on the call. Um, please use the link that's in the chat box. You just click on it. You can see my schedule. You can book in a conversation. And Jody's email has been posted in there as well. Um, so email her directly to have that conversation. And we really look forward to hearing from you and feel free to also visit both of our websites, sign up for our newsletters to stay up to date on future webinars um, from both of us and future content that we are both happy to provide for you. So thank you so much. Uh, thank good you, luck everyone. And enjoy the rest of your day. Yes. Bye, everyone.